Good evening. Welcome and welcome back to the BMW Guggenheim Lab. My name is Charles Montgomery. I'm the lab team member who is uh, hosting the site for these last couple of weeks. We've been spending uh, the better part of two months looking at this notion of comfort design systems in the city. And of late, particularly in the last couple of days, the mood has gotten a little dark. Uh, not simply because we are listening to and hearing the powerful messages emanating from uh, Wall Street, uh, but also because our own programming has, um, particularly last night, veered into, the, uh, uh, into predictions of our common future in cities. And we did have a debate last night between uh, J.S. Russell, a uh, architecture critic for Bloomberg, and James Howard Kunstler, who is um, as articulate as he is cantankerous and very pessimistic. So we are pleased that uh, before we have a chance to buy guns and build walls, which are not his only uh, suggestions, he calls for some bravery, guts, and creativity, um, Today we are looking at an, uh, another set of uh, predictions, but also prescriptions for the kind of future we might share in cities. And th these, in some ways, can be optimistic. We're especially lucky to have one of our uh, advisory committee members here tonight, Juliet Shore, professor of uh, sociology at Boston College, author, and in some ways, I believe an optimist about the kind of future we can have if we pay attention to the possibilities of networked systems, the possibilities of digital solutions, um, the warnings of um, the sustainability movement, but also the potential that can come when we work together and embrace new forms of consumption. So I am so pleased to be able to introduce Julia Shore. Welcome to the lab tonight, and particularly leading us into a new discussion later on in the evening. Great. Great. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and um, having sort of uh, known about the lab uh, for a long time for the, through the planning stages and very excited to be able to come and see how things are actually working in practice and um, it's wonderful that you all could be with us here tonight in this really interesting and I've got the word challenging in the title of my talk and I will definitely say that giving a talk to two audiences uh, on opposite sides of the room <laughs> is its own challenge. So um, if you find me veering too much to one side, make sure I, I know about it uh, the next time I turn in your direction. Um, I want to talk today about both a, the large model of a new way to live in cities and outside of cities, um, but since our population is increasingly urban, um, and the global population uh, is increasingly urban, it, and it's particularly, I think, relevant for urban life. Um, a new model, and I'm going to focus specifically on the consumption side of it, but I am going to embed that a little bit in some of the larger issues of um, larger economic context and talk a little bit about what um, economists call labor markets. Um, and I did want to begin, um, th this, this work comes out of my most recent book, which was originally published as Plenitude, and uh, how's that for an optimistic word to talk about where we could go from uh, the current moment, which is hardly one that most people are experiencing as a moment of plenitude. In fact, people are experiencing it in just the other way, and I'll talk about why I think that's not uh, necessarily the way we have to, um, but retitled, um, since people had a lot of trouble remembering that word and spelling it right and so forth, true wealth, how and why millions of Americans are creating a time-rich, ecologically light, small-scale, high-satisfaction economy. So this is both about 
a vision that I have for where we could go. So it's, it's prescriptive, it's normative in that sense, but it's also an attempt to put together um, a lot of what is already happening and what I see as some of the key emergent trends in the area both of consumption and also of production. And, and actually one of the big things that I want to talk tonight about is a more integrated understanding and a more integrated practice of consumption and production. So um, having gone down to uh, Wall Street today and um, checked out what was happening, I thought it would be particularly important to put the uh, protests that are spreading from here all around the country into some perspective because that perspective is one of the key contexts which prompted me to write this book. Because um, the book is about, it's about economics and it's about ecology and it's about the, the t those twin crises of the dysfunction of our economy and what the dysfunction of our eco planetary ecology, particularly the destabilization of our climate system. But I'm going to give you two graphs um, and actually the latest data that we have on this just go to 2008, so we're a little bit behind. But if we had the new data, what we know at least from uh, what we do know, um, you know, we don't know everything yet, but uh, the post-crash period has further intensified what is a historic rate of uh, income uh, concentration at the very top. Um, when I got into this business, talking about the growth and inequality in the 1970s and 80s, we talked about the 80% and the 20%, because that was basically what was happening, 20% getting a larger and larger share. Then we talked about the top 10%, and now it's the one in the 99, as you know. So this is what's happening, concentration of uh, income of course, wealth is much, much, much more concentrated than income. Um, and we have uh, the large majority, 80% of the people in this, in this country, uh, one of the richest countries in the world, uh, hold 13% of total wealth. Only 13% going to uh, the bottom 80%. So that top 1% holds a really even larger share of um, wealth. Second point, Herman Cain notwithstanding, yesterday I guess he said the people who don't have jobs uh, are like unemployed because they're lazy and aren't trying and don't work hard. Uh, this is a graph, th this is for you Herman. Uh, number of job seekers per available job in this country and um, you can see that in a better functioning economy we're down in the sort of two uh, range, uh, when things get really nice from the point of view of looking for a job, we, we can go under two, um, but we are, we're at about five people looking for every available job right now. So we have persistent unemployment and underemployment, and I could give you lots more statistics, 25 million people in this country either don't have a job officially which means they're actually looking, despite the poor odds, or they are involuntarily underemployed. So they have a little bit of work, but not enough. And that doesn't count the, pe uh, count the people who are discouraged. The fraction of our population who is in employment has plummeted since this downturn began. And although we officially went into recovery in 2009, um, I think what is generally understood is that recovery has been extremely anemic. We had today yet another uh, piece of bad economic news on the job front. Only about 50,000 jobs uh, created in the last month. Um, but we need half a million jobs created every month to get us out of this um, predicament to get us back to some normal kind of labor market functioning within a couple of years. And that is not going to happen even at the most rapid job growth that we've gotten since the downturn. We're, we're looking at nothing like that. We're, you know, the, the 100,000 a month uh, numbers are what look good. So 
We have a long-term unemployment and underemployment problem on our hands. It's not going to go away. And if we are, as many people believe, including myself, that we're seeing signs we're moving into a double dip recession, that's only going to get worse. So we need to start thinking radically about different kinds of economic models. Now, one of the problems uh, and one of the reasons we've had such um, difficulty is that our economic discourse is, remains rooted in a conversation that was um, started and appropriate for the economic problems of the 1930s. The Great Depression um, and the idea there was that we have Go growth, government-led growth that pulls us out of that and creates a lot of jobs. And there's, there's something to be said for that, but there are two big reasons why that's going to be inadequate. Um, and it's not going to, there's not a politics to make it happen at the moment anyway. The first is that any given level of growth in the economy today um, yields far fewer jobs than it used to then. In 1930, every dollar of government spending or every dollar of additional demand pumped into the economy had a much bigger impact. Last year, American corporations created 2.5 million jobs, but 1.5 million of those were in other countries. So we ha we're a much more globalized economy. Not that many jobs are created here. And also, we're in the midst of a digital revolution. Uh, uh, Charles talked about that, in, in which labor becomes less and less important because we can use technology to do many things that before we had people doing. So we've got a lot of productivity growth going on, which makes it hard to put lots of people back to work. So that's the first point. The second one is that that growth itself, that growth in GNP that um, economists keep talking about and that the political discourse is so fixated on is itself a significant survival problem because the faster we grow, the more greenhouse gases we produce. And the only countries that have been able to make any significant progress on the climate front are the ones whose economies have collapsed. So we've got, a, we've got the scientists, and when I was writing this book, it was the run up to Copenhagen. Uh, the scientists are telling us we're, we're you know, rushing toward a precipice. We've got to do something. We've got to take control of this global economy with its fossil fuel uh, energy system that is creating such high levels of greenhouse gas emissions. And, and we've got to make some changes there. And the macroeconomic conversation is, in this country was, how do we get to the cliff faster? Let's rev up the engine. So this is a slide um, that's about ecological overshoot. I mean, it's just a heuristic here. Um, but sometime after 1980, according to the ecological footprint measures, which are land and sea, shallow seawater measures of the amount of resources that a society needs to reproduce its annual standard of living. So it's annual consumption. It's actually a consumption-based measure. So how much land do we need to grow trees for wood, uh, for food, uh, seawater for fish, um, metals, et cetera, et cetera? What's that, um, what, is, what are the natural resources that we need? And how do those relate to the natural resources that are available on the planet. So as a planet, as a, as a global civilization, we went into what's called overshoot in the 1980s, meaning we began to run down the natural capital of the earth to degrade our ecosystems. And carbon and um, greenhouse gas emissions are the big part of that. They're 70 percent of the US footprint. Now, since I'm going to talk about consumption, and I'm going to talk specifically about material consumption, I thought I'd just give you some of the latest uh, really interesting numbers that are coming out of Europe. Um, economists talk only in value terms. And one of the things, as I got more and more into ecological issues, was I became less and less satisfied with 
dollar numbers like GNP. And so economists and other social scientists who worry about ecological issues have started measuring materials. Um, some of them are engineers, but not all of them. And this is a figure from my book of worldwide materials extraction. So how much timber and fossil fuels in weight terms, how much land got displaced for mining, how much biomass, et cetera, um, was used in the global economy. Back in the 1980s, the economists said to us, don't worry, we can keep growing. We're going to dematerialize our GNP. So for every additional dollar of income, we're going to use less and less materials, less carbon. That's what the whole discussion about efficiency and new technologies is. It's about the possibilities that new technologies give us to dematerialize. And they do give us possibilities, but only if they're embedded in the right economic and social systems. And what we found is that just relying on technology in the market, which is what's happened since 1980, the neoliberal era, which said no policy to deal with any of this, we've had increases in global material extraction. Some reduction in materials per dollar of GDP, but always outweighed by the growth in the total size of the economy. And last year, in fact, the energy intensity of a dollar of global GDP actually rose. In the United States, we're particularly bad. We were a lot worse than the global average, which is um, not a good thing given that we're such a wealthy society that could have afforded to do much more in the way of dematerializing. Um, we in, in North America, so that's uh, driven by the US, uh, but Canada also um, uh, much smaller than the US, but they've also had a big increase in certain kinds of material flows. Um, North American material extraction increased by more than 66% from 1980 to 2005. And you can see something uh, there. You see fossil fuels, of course, because we didn't respond properly to the oil price uh, uh, increases and the shortages in the 1970s. Um, we just continued to use fossil fuels and oil in particular in a very profligate way in contrast to Europe, for example, which reduced its oil consumption a lot. Um, but the other thing you can see here is the housing boom. That's the green rectangle. Tremendous increases in construction materials. Estimates are that something like half of the construction, the, the, the actual material resources in construction end up getting wasted because of the kind of outmoded construction paradigm that we have. But that housing boom dramatically increased production materials. And here's another really important point, that when you waste resources, you often also have a dysfunctional sort of financial dimension that's going along with that, which of course is we had a housing bubble and lots of economic problems in construction, not just materials problems. So one last slide on materials, and then I'm going to get to some of the fun stuff about um, not what's going on at the site of production, but actually in our own households uh, for consumption. Each of these rucksacks measures how much people consume in material terms per day, per person in different parts of the world. So this is literally, oh my God, he says. Yeah, and that's the reaction of most people. Remember, it's not what's happening in your house, but if you bought that super light Mac Air, it's all of those other sand and water and um, metal and so forth uh, resources that were used to produce it. Or if you're wearing an ounce of gold, the, I'm not going to remember this number off the top of my head, I think 2,000 pounds of earth that were moved to get it. Wrong number. Or just someone shaking his head. <laughs> A very large number. Um, in the United States, we are using here 88 kilograms, remember that's 2.2 uh, pounds per kg, um, per person, per day. That's all, that's both, you know, the weight of what we've got in our homes that we're consuming, but all of the backstory. And that's for the economy as a whole. And we can point some fingers at some profligate large institutions, not households like the military 
the government, big business, and so forth. They're, they're doing a lot of this, but households are also playing a major role. So let's get it to the household level, because when I show slides like this, people shake their heads, and many disbelieve it, because it just doesn't seem right that 162 pounds a day per person, or it's actually a little bit more than that, my math is 88 times 2.2. Um, so one other point here, because there's so much China and India bashing in the ecological conversation. Look at their one rucksack. Less than a rucksack, 14 pounds a day in comparison to R88, and of course, where are BMW friends? Europeans at half what Americans are. Um, they've done a lot more in Europe to reduce their materials uh, use. So let's talk about uh, one consumer good that lots of people are familiar with and that has actually attracted a lot of our psychic energy as we think about what's happening in the world of consumption in recent years, and that is clothing. And from the chuckles, I can hear that some people, this is a, this is a, a slide that maybe um, it resonates. So in, in my book, I um, calculated how much people are consuming, not at the production level, but just in the household. So how many clothes are they buying? And how did that change? How many pairs of shoes, how many cell phones and laptops and bookcases and couches and sporting goods, pieces of equipment and how many little knickknacks and toasters and you name it. Try to cover the whole straw baskets and all kinds of things that consumers are uh, buying. And I looked at, um, well, uh, we've got more data on apparel than anything else. The average American between uh, 1991, in 1991, the average American purchased 34 pieces of new apparel, outerwear and underwear, per year. Does not include hosiery. That would increase it. 31 pieces. In 2007, the average American consumed 67 pieces of outerwear and underwear. Jackets, pants, coats, bathing suits, etc. This is a huge increase in a relatively small period of time. And it led to a condition which is um, really, for the historian in me, I have to use a word that I wouldn't normally use because it's not a very scientific word. Um, but if we think about this increase in consumption and what happened as a result of it, both pictures like this, but now I'm going to show you another one, pictures like this is kind of historically mind-boggling. And that is that you could buy used clothing by the pound, perfectly good used clothing. In fact, some of it still had the tags on it, uh, clothing that might have been worn only a couple of times, some of it very expensive clothing. You can go to thrift shops like this one near where I live in Boston. It's called the Garment District. And actually, when I first started studying this, it, it was only a dollar a pound. It went up with the recession because the supply increased and the demand supply decrease and the demand increased, but um, the fact that perfectly good wearable clothing was available at such a cheap price, less than food, you could, less than, um, you could buy some beans or rice, for example, is historically unprecedented because his clothing is a very expensive commodity to produce in real terms in ecological terms and in labor terms. Now, we're not paying those workers anything, and we're not accounting for the tremendous ecological damage that's done either from the cottons or the synthetics, uh, the transport, and so forth. But uh, clothing turn, it, it, it's, a, you know, it's not the most ecologically intensive of all goods, but it's actually, uh, it's not, you know, it's up there in terms of significant eco-consequences. So used clothing became nearly free 
before the crash. You could almost not give it away. And this signified an extreme disjuncture between the real economics of what was going on and how the, the, the sort of the, the financial, the financial economics or the, 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 the way the market was dealing with this. Because you had surfeits of used clothes, mountains and mountains of clothes, and one of the things you can see is that people started giving away clothes at historically unprecedented rates. They started giving them to places like that thrift shop I showed you. They started putting them in the household waste stream, and that went up a lot. And they started uh, those, uh, all of those um, NGOs that took those donations. Um, Goodwill could only put a few percent of what it collected into its stores. A lot of it went abroad into a secondary market. And the more we bought in the United States, the more we sent abroad. And I have a little model that predicts that. So by the end of it, this, um, we had a situation where apparel consumption was out of whack, an acceleration of a kind of fashion cycle, what I call the cycle of acquisition and discard. But it turned out it wasn't just apparel. And it happened for uh, a whole range of commodities. And I'm going to show you those in a minute. But therein also lies the first step to a solution. Um, I told you I'm going to give an optimistic talk, so we've got to talk about solutions. Um, and some incredible innovation that starts happening around this. And this is a company called ThreadUp. And ThreadUp started with the, I think, not that bad observation that you don't wear 25% in the, of the clothes in your closet. Join ThreadUp and start exchanging for them for some that you will. And it became the Netflix of clothing. They created some of these handy little mailers. You put your used clothes in. You send it off to somebody who would like them. And in return, a nice bulging mailer comes in the mail and gives you some new clothes. And you didn't have to pay for them. Now, ThreadUp eventually started specializing in children's clothing, because that's a really big part of this market. But they are merely one of many new innovations that are basically bringing people together. And I call this connected consumption, because it's bringing consumers or the buyer and seller side of the market, if you want to think of it that way, together, often without a middle person um, to exchange on a wide variety of, uh, across a, a wide variety of circumstances. So it might be trades, there might be money involved, or there might not be, um, the whole kind of running the gamut of different ways to exchange. And here I have a couple. This is a swap not shop, which is a swapping online. And here's a face-to-face -face one where people bring clothes and meet other people, and they look at the clothes, and they take them back, and it happens at a hotel. So apparel was the leading industry in which this started to happen, and, and in which you see a real proliferation of trading of used goods or actually I should say purchased goods, because sometimes people were trading away or giving away goods that they bought that they didn't actually wear, which is more the case in apparel than anything else. Um, but let me just give you uh, one other, I, I talked about other commodity groups in which things like this happened. Um, in my book, I traced the evolution of this uh, kind of huge buying spree in a number of commodities, and this is the detailed uh, estimates that we did for consumer electronics and some other, mostly cons uh, electro uh, small appliances, consumer electronics, uh, but also furniture. Furniture, we had 105, 150% increase between 1998 and 2005. Um, some of the data extends all the way up to 2007. These are very tedious to calculate because we have to get every single type of furniture that gets imported into the United States. And there are many, 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 many types of them. So we did it for 2005 and haven't redone it yet. But um, more than a, or a, about a doubling of the furniture items. And one of the things you know 
is that you can walk around cities now and find perfectly serviceable furniture out on the street, right? You can see bookcases, and I call this the IKEA effect. It's kind of similar to the Walmart effect in, in some other commodities. Um, but cell phones, American consumers bought 14 0.2 million cell phones, and that's okay, don't worry. <laughs> um, cell phones in 1998, and then uh, 177 in 2005, and of course the whole structure of the industry is pushing us toward turning over those phones uh, every 18 months or so. Laptops, 3.3 .3 to 23.8. Consumer electron, and, and by the way, it's not just the you know, the newer products. It's also vacuum cleaners and ovens and toasters and coffee makers. Consumer electronics uh, doubled the, the number of pieces in a very short period of time. So um, this then brings us to, on a much larger scale, the possibility of transforming the way we consume because at the end of this big consumer binge, we are both exhausted financially, because one of the big things that propelled all of that was consumer debt, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute, and of course, ecologically, because all of these things had a really big ecological impact on the earth, and I've already talked about that. So we start to see a reaction to this particularly as the crash happens, we start to see people who are thinking about new ways of consuming and creating new kind of connections that allow them to get out of this, uh, what I've called work and spend cycle. And actually, that's one of the things we really need to deal with. <sighs> Horns. <laughs> so, we're very familiar with things like Creative Commons and the idea of these alternative ways of producing in the digital world, in the online world, for ideas and culture. We got Napster, we got file sharing, we got um, online blogging, we got consumers making commercials, um, we got people doing all kinds of incredible creative stuff and sharing it. We got Wikipedia and Linux and people doing peer-to-peer -peer production and co-production and collaborative production and so on and so forth in that online space. But it's, it, uh, the second phase of this, um, which really starts to accelerate once the downturn happens, is that some of those same trends also start to appear offline in what we might think of as the, the open hardware movement and an analogy to the open software movement. So you start to see people doing things differently in the consumption space. Now, let me say, I just want to say a couple, of, before I get into some of the more details on that, let me say a couple of things about the critique of consumption that comes up with the recession. I just started to mention this. On the one hand, you have impacts of the recession on people's um, attitudes toward consumption, and particularly, there's a kind of um, hangover effect from that big consumer binge that I was talking about and that I was showing you those numbers. People start to say, things got out of whack, we overspent, too many days at the mall, too much of a, a focus on me instead of we. These are what ethnographers found people saying after the crash. Um, worry about spending beyond one's means, fear about debt, and of course watching what was happening to other people, and of course many people having really bad experiences with losing their homes, losing their jobs, um, and the relationship of that to their prior spending habits, people really cutting back. Big changes in how people see luxuries and necessities. Starting in the 1970s, pollsters started asking people, what's a luxury and what's a necessity? And there was a single direction for those answers and everything, uh, all of the things that we buy in our lives, all the consumer goods, increasingly were moving from the luxury category to the necessity category, with maybe one or two exceptions of things that were getting technologically outmoded. But things that when they came in, people saw as kind of amazing and luxurious and come to see as absolutely necessary, whether it's a microwave or air conditioning or air conditioning in your car or a TV or two TVs or a computer, et cetera, et cetera. After the crash, 
that turns around for the first time and more and more of these things start to be seen as well I can do without it people saying that's a luxury not a necessity so our ideas of what is what we have to have, what's normal change. Um, a growing attraction to saving and rejection of debt. Quite widespread across the population. You see big increases in savings that happen. And a growing green consciousness where people increasingly are thinking about what they consume in terms of its impact on the planetary environment. And large numbers of Americans thinking we need to um, conserve energy and we need more sustainable lifestyles. So the cutting edge of consumer culture in many ways then becomes this kind of connected or collaborative consumption as it has also been called. And I have here one of, uh, one of the examples of uh, one of the online um, communities, they call themselves, um, but an online, uh, this is a nonprofit um, in which people trade, uh, in which people exchange goods for free. And it's called Free Cycle. And you join a Free Cycle community and you give away what you don't want. And the understanding is that you also take things from others. So you both give and receive. And free cyclers think of themselves as part of a free cycling community. So it builds social connection, it reduces ecological footprint, and it's easy on the wallet, which is an especially important thing in times like these. Free cycle becomes one of many innovations. Some of them are old fashioned. I have here a tool library. Tool libraries have been around for a long time. A lot of them uh, were established in low income and African American communities where people didn't have the money to have a full set of tools, but they tended to do a lot of home renovation and other kinds of work around the home. So they set up tool libraries for people to share. But we have car sharing, we have ride sharing, we have couch sharing uh, with the couch surfing. We have um, all kinds of sharing going on. So it's also a sharing and what we might think of as a caring economy because people are connecting more with each other. The online environment makes possible certain sorts of innovations like dealing with the trust problems. Are you just going to let a stranger come into your home to be on your couch? Well, if you can find out about en enough about that person from the other people who, who, to whom he or she is not a stranger, maybe you will. And this has been particularly a phenomenon that is um, popular among younger people. Uh, so we've got couch surfing and uh, what is the fastest form, fastest growing form of transportation in the world, bike sharing. And uh, let's not forget food. We've also got a lot going on in the food space here, whether it's people swapping soup. And this has a kind of decidedly depression feel to it in its uh, design. Um, but we've got people sharing land, people who have land but don't have time or skills to garden and other people, uh, hooking them up with other people who have time and skills or, um, and don't have land. So there's innovation going on in goods, in services, in food, in energy, um, in transport, and it turns out to be something that I think is going to be very significant. Now, why is that? Why is it just not the latest thing that people are just kind of jazzed about because it's sort of different and technologically cool and so forth? And it is all of those things, but it is a phenomenon that is especially to, uh, expected, we would expect it especially to grow in a recessionary period. Why? In a booming economy, people work longer hours and they have more money. And so things that take more time um, are, they move away from them. Uh, you may have experienced this in your own life, but if you're making a lot of money and don't have much time, you're more likely to buy more things. You're more likely to buy more prepared foods. You're more likely to pay other people to do things that you need, so on and so forth. In a recession, that equation shifts. People, generally speaking, so on average, people work less, and that has happened. Working hours have declined. 
uh, for people in jobs, and of course we have increased numbers of people without jobs, and people have less uh, money uh, uh, discretionary for discretionary spending. So they can shift to ways of consuming that may require a little bit more time, but which are cheaper. And that's what all of these connected consumption uh, innovations, for the most part, do. So that's the first point. The economics of these make a lot of sense. The second is that the internet and digital technologies have drastically reduced what economists will call the transactions costs. If you had to organize a barter economy with a pencil and paper, it's very, very difficult. If you can do it online, so, so much of the calculation, the transactions that have to be done are done you know, virtually instantaneously once you have a good software for your uh, site. So transactions costs are drastically reduced and some of the trust and reputation issues are also solved through the technology. Um, what these consumption, uh, connected consumption innovations allow us to do is to take excess capacity the empty couch, the free room if you participate in Airbnb, which is a bed and breakfast kind of thing that individuals do with their spare room. The spare, that spare land that I talked about a few minutes ago. Those 25% of clothes in your closet that the thread up people focused in on. Those are all examples of spare capacity. Or maybe the extra room in your garage that you rent out to somebody who needs to store stuff. Or the uh, car sharing that you do, uh, or the excess capacity that exists when a group of people in a neighborhood get together to buy a lawnmower rather than having every house in the neighborhood buy one individually. All of those are examples of ways of how we can use um, productive assets and consumer goods more, um, utilize them more fully and therefore reduce the costs for the individuals or turn them into income producing assets for the owners. And this is something that's happening um, across a wide range of uh, particular assets. And then, of course, uh, excess capacity and time and space, which I just talked about. So I want to talk, uh, just before I end, about one of these innovations that I'm studying in depth now. I have a MacArthur grant to study this whole field of connected consumption. And we're doing case studies on a lot of them. And the one we started with is the Time Bank. Time Bank is interesting to us. It has a 1970s, uh, late 70s, early 80s origin. A Time Bank is an organization in which people join and and they then offer services to each other um, without money. So they trade hours of time. So time is the currency. Um, and you know the definition of it is up here. Um, so if I join the time bank, I think about what it is that I have to offer to people. Well, OK, I'm a speaker. That's probably not going to go over too well. But I'm also, you know, I know how to cook. and. I can babysit for you. I have a car. I can take you to the airport. Uh, I can help you with your resume. Um, what else do I know how to do? I don't know. People find it, it's actually a, a process of self-discovery when people join time banks, it turns out, because many of them think, uh, well, there's a lot of stuff I want, but I don't really know how to do much. And when they get into the orientation and the initial process, they think, oh, yeah, well, I'm pretty good at this, and I'm pretty good at that. So it has a, some neat personal dimensions to it. So you join a time bank, and you trade with other people. Every time you offer a service, you get credit for the number of hours that you spent on it. And then you can use those credits to get services from other people. Maybe it's massages, maybe it's plumbing. Maybe it's vegan baking, which is the one that my research assistants tell me they're going to get for me. Um, two of the uh, uh, early uh, innovators in the time banking world say, we hope to create an immaterial currency, time, and a parallel microeconomy for the cultural community, one that is not geographically bound, and that will create a sense of worth for many of the exchanges that already take place within our field, particularly those that do not produce commodities and often escape the structures that validate, i.e. the market, that validates only certain forms of exchange as significant or profitable. Now, one of the interesting things about the time bank is that it insists on a principle of ra radical egalitarianism, that every person's hour is 
worth the same. And you can see that that's a limiting, it, it's both an empowering form and it creates more social change, but it can also be a limiting form because they have a hard time getting plumbers and electricians to join the time bank and offer those services in return for babysitting and vegan baking, which don't command nearly the same wage on the market. So there are really interesting and important issues of social inequality here and inequality of what uh, Pierre Bourdieu called uh, cultural capital. Um, and we're also studying those. We're studying the ways in which even a structure that is designed to radically equalize can end up uh, reproducing social inequality. And um, I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A, but it's, it's really, it's a very interesting dimension of it. Now, many of the other innovations on, in the connected consumption field are not quite as connecting, um, and therefore not necessarily interested in reducing inequality. So for example, there are four profit versions of time banks that have appeared now. Uh, is, I think Zarly.com is not here yet. Is it in New York? But Zarly.com is a site you can go to when you need a task done. Um, and their little video shows the woman who's sitting at her office, the busy uh, professional who forgot to buy dog food for the dog and needs to get that dog fed. She goes online, she puts that task in, and there are a group of people there who are looking for tasks to do and get money for them. Uh, they then bid on the task, they offer different amounts, she chooses the provider that she wants, the provider goes, get, buys the dog food, comes to her office, gives her the dog food, gets the money. Uh, there's another one called Task Rabbit, which does something like that. So there are forms of this kind of consumption um, that also uh, are much more like the kind of market that we have. They're monetized, they're for profit, they don't have a social, uh, they don't have an egalitarian uh, agenda to go with them. And we're looking across the different forms. Um, I want to say one more thing. Uh, I said at the beginning that I wanted to talk about the relationship between production and consumption. And there's something else that's going on in, this, uh, in the country now, which is, um, you can think of it as consumption. These are people who are doing, um, what we would colloquially call DIY, do it yourself, what uh, the academic literature has called self-providing or self-provisioning, so rather than buying things on a market, make for self. Uh, the connected consumption that I've talked about so far has a little bit of this, but the, it, with the services. Uh, the goods exchange are typically goods that are, are produced um, you know, in factories and by companies and then and just purchased. Um, and the self-providing that's going on today has a new dimension to it because it, there's a high-tech dimension to it. It's using digital technologies and it's using high levels of um, what I would call ecological knowledge, uh, but we might think of that as human capital. So very knowledge intensive production that's going on at a household level. And I have here um, a couple of different examples, um, but basically in an, in an economy like the one we're living in now, in which working hours are depressed, in which there are large numbers of people who have excess time, because they're unemployed or underemployed, or even if they're fully employed, their hours are lower. There are many hours freed up for productive activity, number one. And number two, the need to procure goods and services in cheaper ways gets larger and larger because people's incomes are falling, people's uh, housing uh, values are falling, their portfolios are um, shrinking. Uh, you know, we've got a, a collapsing stock market. And in, at the beginning of my book, I talk about why the economic trends in, in what I call the business as usual economy are not good going forward over the next decade or so. And I'm happy to get into that more in the Q&A. But in a world like that, where you don't expect 
a rapidly expanding economy to bring you financial wealth, there are other ways of meeting needs. And you can take those hours that you have and make them productive, not just by acquiring goods and services cheaply or freely, like in free cycle or sharing, but also by increasingly beginning to produce things for yourself or in community with others. And permaculture, which is a, um, a, a, a form of agriculture that uses high levels of ecological knowledge and is also adapted in many cases. There's an urban permaculture form. Um, so that's urban food growing, uh, alternative home construction using low cost natural materials, which is another booming sector, micro generation of energy. And I also put in here, uh, this is a much smaller um, sector in terms of people doing it, but I think has a lot of potential going forward. Small scale manufacturing using what are called fab lab technologies, so fabrication technologies. And these are literally desktop size machines that uh, a set of machines, the Fab Lab concept came out of MIT, but you can use them to produce all kinds of things, bicycles, clocks, um, computers. You can use them to produce more machines like the ones that are doing the producing. You can even use them for uh, prefab home construction. So a lot of interesting stuff. And here's a picture of permaculture. Here's a little bit more detail on the Fab Lab technology. Uh, the point is that shifting into this new kind of consumer culture also meshes very well with a new, much more active production side as people become much more creative, much more entrepreneurial, much more socially connected in their this extra market activity. And it's the, the core of what I call this plenitude model. Shorter hours of work in the formal economy, more connected consumption, more high-tech do-it-yourself, and finally, more social connection, which is what comes from the, the previous three. All of those are forms of what I call uh, true wealth, different kinds of wealth than financial wealth. But as we move forward, I think wealth that will be equally important. And I will end with... Um, the concept of just the idea of the emergence of this new lifestyle, which I think is happening all around the country. Thank you.